This is the first uh, seminar in the QFT and geometry seminar series. Um, presumably everyone's seen the website, which has a list of the different talks and uh, the list of organizers. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, my fellow organizers, Ibu Ba, Jonathan Heckman, Sarah Pasquetti, Shlomo Razamat, Sakura Sheffer Nemeki, and Alessandro Tomasiello. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Sakura for taking the initiative on this and being the driving force in getting this going and um, creating the webpage and also Ibu for setting up all of the Zoom stuff. So today we're um, very happy to have Zomar, Zohar Kormagatsky and let me just turn off my broadcast so Zohar can switch over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Let me just share the screen again. Is it working, Ken? Yeah, it's working. So Zohar asked me to um, encourage people to ask questions. Feel free to ask questions either in chat or just to turn on your microphone and ask the question. Uh, if you're not asking a question, maybe it's better just to turn off the microphone to avoid background noise. So without further ado, let's have Zohar. Okay, so thanks again. I'm very excited uh, for this uh, seminar. It's my basically first such a Zoom seminar. Um, so this will be about the high temperature limit of quantum field theory. And feel free to interrupt with questions whenever you like, just unmute yourself. And uh, so this work is uh, not published yet, but we're working on finishing it up. It's in collaboration with my student Chang Ha Choi from uh, Stony Brook and um, also the Hebrew University group. Uh, Noam Chai, Sumya Deep, Joe Dory, Eliezer Rabinovich, and Misha Smolkin. So let me, uh, so the first few slides will be a, a slow introduction and uh, in which I'll try to define the question. And then I'll try to give you our best current understanding of what the answer is, though we have not completely solved the problem. So let's start with some very uh, basic facts. Uh, there are many known Hamiltonians or quantum filters which uh, exhibit uh, symmetry breaking, sorry, which exhibit symmetry breaking at the low temperatures or zero temperature. So one famous example in particle physics is of course massless QCD which exhibits uh, chiral symmetry breaking at uh, zero temperature. Ferromagnets are a, a famous class of examples in condensed matter physics. More recently, the nail phase and the nail VBS transition are famous examples in condensed matter physics. So there is, of course, a huge class of quantum field theories which break some global symmetry at uh, zero temperature or very low temperatures. Now, in school, we're usually taught that if you hit the system up, namely you increase the temperature, and instead of studying the system in the vacuum, you study it in the thermal state, which is the, the density matrix of the thermal state is e to the minus beta h. If you study the system in that density matrix, it's ordinarily believed that at sufficiently small beta, which corresponds to very high temperatures, all the symmetries are restored. Mathematically, what it means is that order parameters have zero expectation value at sufficiently small beta. Or more precisely, all the operators which are charged under the corresponding symmetry have zero expectation values for sufficiently small beta. Now, no, no. now in uh, this talk, I will ignore uh, all symmetries other than the ordinary symmetries. So I'm only talking about standard symmetries, such as the chiral symmetry in QCD, or the nail symmetry in anti-ferromagnets or, you know, uh, I'm not talking about higher form symmetries or uh, two groups or any of that stuff, just ordinary symmetries. And the question is, what is the fate of these symmetries at very high temperatures? So if you look at phase diagrams of uh, materials, this is a phase diagram that I basically stole from some paper of, of Bitcoin co-workers. This is the phase diagram of some uh, ferromagnet. The fact that order is restored at very high temperatures means that the phase transition always uh, goes to the left. Uh, namely, it caps the ferromagnetic phase. 
So the yellow phase is the disordered phase, which has no uh, broken symmetries. And the green phase is the broken phase, which has a broken ferromagnetic symmetry. And then there is a critic at zero temperature, which is the, uh, the y equals zero axis. There is a certain point at which there is a quantum critical phase transition. It's a conformal field theory. And, <clears throat> and, and it's important that the black line goes to the left rather than to the right. The black line going to the left is this intuition that uh, uh, at sufficiently high temperatures, you sh all the symmetries must be restored. Are there any questions about it? <laughs> but I thought that to the, the, the y-axis is the temperature, right? Y-axis is the temperature. At y, ah, equals so zero, at y equals to zero, there is a zero temperature phase transition, which is described by conformal field theory. And the main point is that if you heat up the conformal field theory, so you go vertically up from the quantum. Do you see my mouse, by the way? Yes. So if you go just vertically up from the conformal field theory, you enter a disordered phase, a phase with no order. So all the symmetries are restored. And that means that the line of the first, trans first order phase transition must bend to the left to cap the ferromagnetic phase. And if you look at the whole literature on uh, you know, phase diagrams of various kinds of Hamiltonians, it always looks like that. So the lines always turn into the direction of the symmetry breaking. Now, this is something that we basically learn in high school. So when you do your first course on thermodynamics, you learn that the reason that this happens is that you should minimize the free energy rather than the energy. And at sufficiently high temperatures, the term that dominates is ST. So at sufficiently high temperatures, you should aim to find the highest entropy states. And the highest entropy states tend to be disordered. Uh, namely, they don't have any order, which corresponds to symmetry breaking. So we're taught in schools, in school that uh, essentially at high enough temperatures, you would always enter some disordered state, a state with no symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a high school uh, reasoning for this. And then there's a much more highbrow reason, which is much more sophisticated, that you can think about in terms of ADS-CFT. So in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence, <clears throat> A, a finite temperature conformal field theory is dual to a black brain. And then there is a large amount of uh, papers by Herzog, Hartnell, Faulkner, many others that I did, couldn't even cite. Many, many people prove that black brains in anti deciter space have no hair. So this statement that I'm talking about is actually dual to the no hair theorem in ADS. And that's actually the original reason that I got inter interested in the subject. I try to see if there is a proof of the no hair theorem in filter. So the no hair theorem about black brains in ADS is a tantamount to the statement that if you take a conformal field theory, you heat it up, you enter a no, you enter, enter a disordered phase, a phase with no symmetry breaking. Okay. So the question is very clear. It's uh, I think non-perturbatively well defined. We take a CFT in D plus one space time dimensions. We turn on some temperature. And actually in conformal field theory, the temperature is in material. Whether the temperature is 0 0.1 or one, it doesn't matter. Because in CFT, there is no inherent scale. So any temperature is as any other temperature in flat space. Or in other words, if you just go vertically up, there is some sort of uh, scaling. So any temperature is the same as any other temperature. That's what in condensed matter they call quantum critical. So you take a CFT, you turn on some temperature, it doesn't matter which, any temperature is as good as any other. And you ask, is it possible that the phase diagram would look like that? Can you rule this out? So that would mean that the order, the ordered phase takes over at arbitrarily high temperatures and the disordered phase is capped. So the Y equals zero uh, axis, namely the X axis is some relevant operator, it's some coefficient. <laughs> that was above this was some transverse magnetic field and you ask whether this is even possible at the you know just at the conceptual level of quantum field theory so that's the question uh, a question yes if you uh, cranked up the temperature really high enough then wouldn't you at, eventually at that disordered phase and at a disordered phase right so for conformal field theory any temperature is as good as any other 
So one way to pose the question, which is very, I think, mathematically correct, is, is it possible that if you take a conformal filter, you put it at some finite temperature, doesn't matter which, is it possible that symmetry breaking would take place? If that's possible, that would mean that all the way to infinite temperature, you would be in an ordered phase. Okay? Yep, thank you. Okay, so this is some, some kind of problem about the... Okay, let me just... Uh, relate it to the comment that was just made. I wanted to uh, make a short comment. There is a large... If you study systems which are not conformal, there could be many scales. And it is possible that at zero temperature, the system would be disordered, then it would be ordered, and then eventually, of course, it's disordered again. This is called intermediate symmetry breaking, intermediate temperatures symmetry breaking. And there is a lot of work on that in condensed matter and also in particle physics. Most notably, notably there is a paper of uh, Steven Weinberg of intermediate symmetry breaking. So Steven Weinberg wrote down a uh, three plus one dimensional quantum field theory, which has a scale and, in, and, and there is some intermediate symmetry breaking in the model that Weinberg wrote. I'm not going to review this model because that's not what I'm after. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, work or in these uh, slides, I'm really after arbitrarily high temperatures. So I'm really after conformal field theories at finite temperatures. But I just wanted, I just wanted to make it clear that there are models which have additional scales where there is some sort of ordered phase at some intermediate point. And actually there are even materials that you can buy on Amazon that exhibit this weird stuff. So there is something that's called the Rochelle salt which is some sodium potassium tetrate. Um, and between minus 18 Celsius and 24 Celsius, uh, it's, uh, in a, it's, a, it's in a funny phase, which is more ordered than uh, its low temperature phase. So there are such physical materials, but of course, when you heat up this uh, crystal to high enough temperatures, of course, it goes into a completely disordered phase. It goes to a quark gluon plasma eventually, which is completely disordered. In fact, it goes to a disordered phase much before. It's something like 57 degrees. Okay, so the question is, are there unitary, local, non-trivial conformal field theories? And we find it many degrees of freedom. By degrees of freedom, I mean something like a central charge, but the central charge gotta be final. Uh, otherwise, it's not really a physical system. Which break a global symmetry at finite temperature. Okay, so this is the question. I don't have a complete answer. I don't have a proof and I don't have a counterexample, but we have something very, very close. We were able to construct a class of conformal field theories in four minus epsilon dimensions. And epsilon is not small. Our examples work for any epsilon between zero and one, which exhibit this phenomenon. So they exhibit symmetry breaking at any finite temperature. Because our examples cannot, for epsilon equals one, our examples break down for a reason that I'll explain at the very end of the slides. So we don't have an example at integer dimensions, but we have an example for any epsilon between zero and one, which exhibits this weird phase diagram where this first order line bends to the wrong direction. So that's what we got at the moment. Also, we don't have an example yet in three plus one dimensions. So our examples are all in fractional dimensions. And as you know, these conformal filters in fractional dimensions, they are not really fully unitary. So for that reason, we don't have a complete answer yet. However, this example that we constructed has many very interesting properties that you might have seen before, even in the context of supersymmetric theories that I'll review. And it has some interesting consequences, even for epsilon equals one. So how can you go about thinking about this problem? So this is another phase diagram, by the way, an example of the same thing. Nail and VBS are the names of some ordered phases in condensed matter and the lines cap them off and you get a disordered phase at high temperatures. So how can you go about attacking this question? Well, you, of course, the trivial cases are not interesting. That's why I wrote non-trivial here. Then you can look at experiments. You can look at experiments and try to find a counterexample. I've looked at the experiments, I didn't find a counterexample. Then you can try to construct weakly coupled conformal filters. That's what we've actually tried to do. 
So our examples are some large N or small epsilon conformal filters that we, we were able to control and we know they exist. And so that's what we mostly do. You can try to use ADS. You can try to prove general theorems. Actually, you'll see that we have a little theorem that is general that we were able to prove. Now, let me just make uh, one more uh, general. There will be two more general comments before I get to what we've actually done. The first general comment is for many purposes, finite temperature is the same as a circle compactification. So you're setting a conformal filter in a circle. And because of that, you can immediately draw some uh, general conclusions. This phenomenon is impossible in one plus one space time dimensions. That's basically Coleman's theorem. Uh, sorry, no, in one plus one dimensions, that's basically the fact that in quantum mechanics, global symmetries cannot break. And it follows immediately from modular invariance. In two plus one dimensions, that's Coleman's theorem. So sorry, I misspoke before. In two plus one dimensions, uh, continuous symmetry cannot break at finite temperatures. And uh, that's a consequence of Coleman's theorem, because once you reduce the theory in a circle, you get a one plus one dimensional theory, which is local. So when we try to attack this problem, your options are either discrete symmetry breaking in two plus one or continuous symmetry breaking in three plus one or something in fractional dimensions. That's the first general comment. Second general comment is that if you look at thermal filtery books, namely books about uh, you know, quantum filter in a circle, there is a morass with something that they call the infrared divergences or the infrared problem. So I wanted to explain that and why this is uh, something that we actually completely have under control. I wanted to explain what is this infrared issue. So actually, let's study a toy model. This toy model is not a conformal filter. It's not directly related to the main problem here that I posed, but it, it, it explains this, this infrared issue, which will be important for us. So just take the five to the four model in three plus one dimensions and put the mass to zero. So we're at the critical point at the very long distances. So actually at zero temperatures, at zero temperature, this model is very easy. It flows to a free filter at long distances and we know everything about it. We can compute everything about it using our renormalization group because it's weakly coupled. Now, if you put this model in a circle, doesn't matter how big or how small the circle is, uh, you can then expand. <laughs> yes? Is there a question? If you expand uh, in the Fourier modes on the circle, well, you get something like that, where I've dropped uh, several terms that are not important. Most importantly, there is a zero mode on the circle, which I called phi naught, and it doesn't have a mass. It has some couplings to the higher Fourier modes on the circle. So there are, those are called the Matsubara modes. So there is some coupling between the zero mode and higher modes, phi n's, but there is no true level mass for phi naught. And this is the issue, this is why you, might, you, you, need, you need to be really worried. Because as you know, now we are in two plus one dimensions because we've reduced on a circle. And in two plus one dimensions, quartic interactions grow strong in the infrared. So now this model is uh, possibly strongly coupled. So even though the zero temperature model was weakly coupled at long distances, the circle reduced model, so the model on a circle can be strongly coupled at long distances. So you gotta be really careful about it. So there is a strong coupling scale lambda, which is given by the scale of the quartic interaction. And you must make sure that all the physics is controlled by energy scales, which are above the strong coupling scale. If you hit the strong coupling scale, then you're in deep trouble. Are there any questions about it? At high temperature, uh, 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 temperature much larger than lambda, you are okay? No, the temperature is beta. So the temperature yeah, is right, but uh, ah, the temperature is better. So, so the strong coupling scale to be above this. Yeah, I see. Strong coupling scale of the two plus one dimensional model is given by the temperature times lambda. So, so your energy are always kind of below this, right? In this. In so now this. you'll see. So the issue, the reason that there is thermal issue, in, infrared issues in thermal filter is because there is strong coupling. Uh huh. And you must make sure that what you do. You, you land on your feet, that you know how to complete the computation despite strong coupling effects. So let's see how this is done. So in this particular model that I'm reviewing, 
you're saved by the belt. You're saved because these uh, interactions between the zero mode and the Matsubara mode lead to such Feynman diagrams, these kind of diagrams. And when you sum them all up, which you can do completely uh, regularization independently, it's a finite thing, you find that these loops generate a mass for the zero mode, which goes like the temperature squared times lambda. And so, so in, in effect, your zero mode is not oh, wow. a zero mode. Somebody should think people. Yeah, somebody should unmute themselves. Yeah. So in effect, the zero mode is not a zero mode because of these uh, diagrams. And so you are saved by the mere factor of square root of lambda. Let's see why. The mass, if you took, if you look, this, this is a mass squared. So you take a square root, you get square root of lambda times temperature. But the strong coupling scale was lambda times the temperature. So you are saved by a mere factor of the square root of lambda. That's what saves you. So if square root of lambda is small, you're safe. Your mass is much above the strong coupling scale. But if square root of lambda were not small, then you would, you would not be able to complete this computation. So, by, so due to these loops, you're saved from strong coupling, and you can reliably conclude that the Z2 symmetry of this model, there is a Z2 symmetry. This is the famous pi to the four model. So there is a Z2 symmetry. So you can reliably conclude that this Z2 symmetry is not broken at finite temperature. How, why do you conclude that? It's because this mass is positive. You see, you actually, amusingly, you encounter the same sum that you know from string theory, the sum over the integers. And there is a minus sign here. So <laughs> this minus sign conspires with the negative Casimir energy in two dimensions to, get a, to give a positive answer. So you're sort of saved by a few funny minus signs that end up up giving a positive mass word. And you can reliably conclude that the Z2 symmetry is not broken. Of course, this model is not UV complete. It's the phi to the four model. It has a Landau fold. So you cannot study this model at arbitrarily high temperatures, because at some point you don't know what you're doing. Lambda becomes very strong, and you cannot solve this model anymore. But uh, for temperatures which are much below the Landau pole scale, this is a correct conclusion. OK, so every time you do conformal filters at finite temperature or any quantum filter at finite temperature, you got to be worried about this infrared issue. And you have to check every time that you're saved from strong coupling. So in these slides, I'll talk about the construction of some models in the epsilon expansion and large n limit. But there are many other things you could do. You could study conformal gauge theories in 3 plus 1. Chern Simons, gauge theories in 2 plus 1, ADS, thermal bootstrap, and so on and so forth. We have not done any of that very seriously. So I'll only present the first thing for which we have uh, very amusing concrete results. Are there any questions before I plunge into the model? Questions about the introduction? So we will study the class of models, which has n scalar fields, phi i. These are real scalar fields with quartic interactions, which are given by a general tensor, lambda i, uh, so lambda i j k l with a twiddle. The twiddle will, get, will disappear soon when I normalize this coupling a little bit more conveniently. These models uh, will be studied in four minus epsilon space time dimensions. And epsilon could be, could be even one. First, we will take epsilon to be very small, and then we will discuss what happens at finite epsilon. These are just the Wilson Fisher fixed points, nothing new. Um, so, we'll take these fixed points, we'll study their thermal behavior, we'll find some interesting theorems and some uh, counterexamples, um, and we'll see what are the consequences of that. So, first, I'll take epsilon to be the smallest parameter in the problem. It's smaller than n. Uh, inverse and it's smaller than anything. So epsilon will be the absolute smallest parameter in the problem. We'll solve the problem and then we'll go beyond that. So if epsilon is the smallest parameter in the problem, you're basically content with the one loop equations. These are the equations for the fixed point. So here lambda could be anything, but if lambda happens, if lambda twiddle happens to solve this equation, then you're at a fixed point. It's convenient to get rid of these uh, factors of epsilon and 16 pi squared by defining this lambda, which has no twiddle. 
and the equation just reduces to that. So we have to basically study some complicated equations. These are real equations, and nobody's classified the solutions. Nobody knows the full set of solutions of these equations. These are the Wilson Fisher fixed points. But of course, people have studied these equations for 40 years, and many known solutions are uh, written down. There are many classes of solutions. And of course, many of these solutions are very interesting for experiment and uh, theory. OK. So one can ask, what happens if you are at such a fixed point and you turn on finite temperature? So you got to compute these diagrams. So that's what we did. You compute these diagrams in 4 minus epsilon. It's not complicated. And you find that you generate a thermal mass. The thermal mass is given by, uh, by a, so there is a sum over k here. You take the lambdas which solve this equation. You take the lambdas which solve this equation. You take a trace over two indices out of four, and that's your mass matrix. Very easy. Mass squared matrix. And you can use the fixed point equations to re-express this mass squared matrix uh, in this way. And actually, the second term is positive definite. So you can argue that the second piece here is positive definite. So some piece in the mass squared matrix is always positive. And, but the first piece is not manifestly positive. So there is some chance that we will be able to find examples which exhibit symmetry breaking um, at the fixed point. Okay, So we're all leveraging this first term, which is not obviously positive. But the second term is, is obviously positive, because i and j sit on the different lambdas, and it's just the square of something. So you have to find, you have to somehow find the solution of these uh, equations at the epsilon expansion, which would exhibit negative mass squared. <clears throat> so how do you do that? So you think about the symmetries. It's useful to think about the symmetries of these models. Uh, so solutions of this equation are classified by the symmetry groups. So everybody knows that the you know, most beautiful solution preserves the full ON symmetry that acts on these n-scalar fields by rotations. So this is the solution. You just take lambda ijkl to be a bunch of delta functions with some coefficient alpha. You plug it into the equations, and you find that alpha is 1 over n plus 8. So this is the famous on fixed point in the epsilon expansion. And then you can just use our general formula for the mass, which is given here. You plug it in, and you find that it's positive. So there is a positive mass squared, and this is just the by screening. So there is a phi thermal gap, uh, phi is massive, and this infrared issue happens again. So you have to carefully check that the scales work out, <coughs> and you're safe from strong coupling, and you can reliably conclude that this model does not break any global symmetry. The thermal mass is positive. OK, so the ON model doesn't work for any end. It doesn't work for any end. So you have to do a little bit more. So you can try to discuss what about fixed points which preserve a subgroup of ON. So there are models which preserve a subgroup of ON, but the subgroup is large enough so that there is still just one quadratic Casimir. Namely, so you why preserve- Why is that one not working? Why, why uh, didn't it produce the subgroup? Word, the mass squared was positive. So the, the ON model has a positive mass, thermal mass squared. And therefore, at finite temperature, there is no symmetry breaking. You just compute and you find that it's positive. The thermal mass squared is positive. It's n plus 2 over n plus 8, which is a positive number for any n. So next, you look for fixed points which preserve a subgroup of the ON symmetry. <coughs> and for large enough Gs, there's still one quadratic Casimir. So the only quadratic invariant mass under G is a sum over all the phi i's. This is actually as a this is actually equivalent to requiring that the fundamental representation of ON is irreducible as a representation of G. If that is true, then it's guaranteed that there is only one quadratic invariant. So these models are sometimes called in the literature one Casimir models. So these are called one Casimir models. Um, 
And we were able to prove a general theorem for those models. For the one Casimir models, no symmetry breaking occurs at finite temperature. Okay, we were able to prove it for all these models for which the fundamental representation of ON is irreducible as a representation of G. I will not go over the proof. It's a little technical, but it's correct. So this no-go no go theorem covers a very large class of examples that people spend many, many years studying. Uh, it covers obviously the ON models, some models that are called cubic, tetrahedral, bifundamental, MN, Michel fixed points, tetragonal. Actually, there is a recent review in the context of the bootstrap of all these classes of fixed points. So you can look it up. But all these models, which have one Casimir, are ruled out. I mean, they behave, they, when, by ruled out, I mean that they behave like normal conformal filters, which upon uh, heating them up, they have only one vacuum, one, dis, one disordered vacuum. So we are led sort of automatically, we're led by this logic to study models with two Casimirs, for which the fundamental representation is reducible. So the simplest class of models are known in the literature as biconical models. I don't know why they're called biconical, but this is the symmetry group that they preserve. OM times ON minus M. <clears throat> now there are two quadratic Casimirs because there is a separate mass uh, for OM and a separate mass for this N minus M fields. So there are two quadratic Casimirs and there are three cubic, uh, three quadratic Casimirs. So alpha, beta, and gamma. So you have three coefficients. You have to write the beta functions for these three coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, solve them, and then check what's the thermal mass. So the beta functions for alpha, beta, gamma take this form. I wrote them down here for you. Uh, these beta functions are not exactly, I mean, we don't know how to write, we cannot write an explicit solution. So it, it's some algebraic equations which we cannot solve explicitly. But for, we were able to analyze them in various limits and then extend the results for finite epsilon. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So the easiest case is the equal rank case. 2m equals n, where n is even. So it's when the two groups are the same, om times om, where n is equal to 2m. Then these three equations actually collapse to two equations and they become solvable. So you solve the equations and you find two solutions. One is the on fixed point for which alpha, beta, and gamma are all the same. It's of course what you expect because if alpha, beta, and gamma are all the same in this convention that this becomes an on symmetric potential. So that solution, which has full ON symmetry, is not interesting because we just, it was part of the no-go theorem. But now there is a new solution, actually. So there is a new solution for which alpha and beta are the same, but gamma is not. And actually, gamma can be negative. For M bigger than 4, gamma becomes negative. However, the scalar potential is still positive definite. So there is no problem with any runaways or instabilities. The scalar potential is positive definite but the gamma can be negative. So for this model, you can again compute the thermal masses, and again, you find that they're positive. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work again. The non-equal rank case, so it seems now that it, one becomes despondent, that this is never going to work, and maybe there is a theorem that it cannot work. But you will soon see that uh, there is a little hint in this slide, which is very hard to spot, that actually you should expect that it wouldn't work in this example, but it would work once the ranks are not the same. So you'll soon see how this comes about. So the non-equal rank case is not explicitly solvable, it's just these real equations are not, do not admit an explicit solution that you can analyze. You can of course solve them numerically, but instead of doing that, I want to develop some way of uh, extending these results also to finite epsilon. So we will rescale the couplings in this way and study the large n limit. Okay, so you rescale the captings in this way, then alpha twiddle, beta twiddle, and gamma twiddle have a smooth large n limit. And x is gonna be m over n, which is the fraction of, you know, m is, was the rank of this group. So m over n is x. So you introduce these things, and now you solve the equations again. Now you can solve the equations again, because in the large n limit, this beta function simplifies. So these three equations simplify, you can solve them, and let me, so you find some very curious facts. <laughs> so let's talk about the first curious fact that you find. In fact, for any x, so even for the equal rank case, if you take this large rank limit, there is not one fixed point or two or three, 
there is a whole circle of fixed points. So I want to explain this figure a little bit better. So this is the axis are alpha, beta, and gamma, which are the three allowed couplings. In fact, they should have been alpha twiddle, beta twiddle, and gamma twiddle. I'm sorry for that. So alpha twiddle, beta twiddle, and gamma twiddle are the three allowed couplings. One point on this circle of fixed points is the critical ON model for which we have a no goal theorem. And then there is a, a bunch of other points. Now some of the blue points are also easy to understand. They're like products of free and critical bosons uh, with OM times ON minus M symmetry. But then there is a whole swath of uh, other fixed points which uh, exist in this large rank limit. So first, so there is an exactly marginal operator. That's what I'm saying. There is an exactly marginal operator in the large rank limit. Another very curious fact, which is that in addition to this exactly marginal operator, it's easy to prove that for every point on this conformal manifold, alpha beta is equal to gamma squared. And if alpha times beta is equal to gamma squared, the potential can be written like that. And if gamma is negative, that means that there is a modulate space of vacua. So it means that for every negative gamma, which is this a half a circle, which is uh, supported at negative gamma, there is everywhere a moduli space of vacua. So the large rank theory has both an exactly marginal operator and the moduli space of vacua, even though it's non supersymmetric. The moduli space of vacua is given just by phi one squared being proportional to phi two squared. So we can draw this moduli space of vacua. We have phi one squared, phi two squared, and we have a line. Along this line, yes? So Yes. Uh, how can you trust this large limit if for the equal rank case, it doesn't agree with the uh, explicit result? Very good. So I'll get to it soon. In the large rank limit, well, <clears throat> in large rank limit, you throw away one of our end corrections. So in the large rank limit, you find an exactly marginal operator. But once you take into account one of our end corrections, this um, conformal manifold is lifted and only some isolated points remain. So the fixed point that we found for equal rank, namely this one, is a point on this circle, which survives the one over n corrections. The other fixed points do not survive the one over n corrections because the exactly marginal operator is lifted. I understand, but you found that the potential was still positive, even though gamma is negative. So somewhere there's some Thing well, uh, you might be troubled by in this the model. potential here is non negative, it's a square of something, but there is a flat direction. Once you take into account one over n corrections, this flat direction is lifted. So, if you want in the equal rank case, if you took this explicit solution and you plugged it in, you would see that there is a shallow direction in the potential. There is no flat direction, but there is a very shallow direction. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So at the origin of this uh, phi one squared, phi two squared, of course, you have the original fixed point. But then if you can go along this moduli space and there is a dilaton and number Goldstone bosons. <clears throat> okay, this is the zero temperature story. The zero temperature story to summarize. So now we take large rank. The zero temperature story is that there is an exactly marginal operator. There is a moduli space of vacua for negative gamma. And it looks like a straight line that intersects the origin. That's the zero temperature story. This, in fact, holds for any epsilon. Though the analysis here was for small epsilon, these facts about the large rank limit are true for any epsilon. Now you can ask, what happens when it, we turn on finite temperature? And when we saw this, we were sure that finite temperature would, of course, lift the moduli space. That's what you expect uh, thermal fluctuations to do. But lo and behold, this is not true. Instead, this line is deformed to a hyperbola. So what finite temperature's effect do is to deform this to a hyperbola. So what phi one squared minus phi two squared, instead of being vanishing, well, I was a little uh, careless when I wrote this equation. There should be square root of beta over square root of alpha in front of square, phi two squared. But uh, that's not important qualitatively. So instead of being a straight line that intersects the origin, once find a deformed moduli space. And this uh, reminded uh, 
some of us of uh, supersymmetric theories where there is a deformation of the moduli space and you avoid the origin. So once you turn on finite temperature, this moduli space is deformed to a hyperbola and the origin is no longer on the moduli space. Okay. And this is, and this happens only if C is non-zero, this coefficient C. C is the coefficient of the hyperbola and it tells you where it intersects the axis. It's actually very important whether C is positive or negative because it tells you which symmetry breaking patterns are allowed. Because, you know, for non-equal rank, you have two groups. One group is bigger than the other. So depending on the sign of C, you might get different symmetry breaking patterns. So it's actually important to fix the sign of C. And it may also be true that for some very special cases, C vanishes, even at finite temperature. So the way to explain the equal rank case is that actually C vanishes accidentally <coughs> when X is equal to a half. So at the equal rank case, the moduli space is not deformed even at finite temperature. And when you take into, into account one over N corrections, this line disappears and only the origin remains. So there is no symmetry breaking. Question? Yes. For equal rank, phi one square and phi two square for the, are they for the two groups? Yes, yes. one squared is the OM. And then isn't it clear that C should vanish rather than accidentally because of the Z2 that exchanges them? Yes, I'm, this is on this slide. I'm going to explain that this is forced by symmetry, in fact. Ah, oh, because you said accidentally. Yes, yes, I was uh, <laughs> misleading the audience, sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not accidentally, it follows from a symmetry, from charge conjugations, from uh, exchanging the two groups. Um, so C vanishes and the hyperbola is not, and the straight line is not deformed. And for this reason, the equal run case is, is very subtle because you basically cannot decide what's the fate of this theory by doing large n computations. You really need to go and understand whether the origin is the true vacuum or somewhere else on the line. And that requires one over n corrections. Luckily for the equal run case, we could do this one over n corrections because we could solve the beta functions, at least for small enough epsilon. And we found that only the origin remains. For finite epsilon, we have not yet solved the equal run case, but I believe that this would be the answer, that only the origin remains. For the non-equal run case, because this uh, line is deformed to a hyperbola, we only need to compute the sine of C, and that's a large computation. And we did that. And what we found is that, uh, well, for X smaller than a half, C is positive, for X bigger than a half, C is negative, or the opposite, doesn't matter, and C vanishes to equals, X equals a half. Uh, which you could have expected by the symmetry. Now, I'm being a little bit careless. I'm trying to explain. I just want, let me just explain it a little bit more rigorously. So there is a circle of fixed points and actually C is a function of where you are. So you have to find which, of, which fixed point on the circle of fixed points survives finite rank corrections and compute C for that specific point. In fact, for any X, C varies along the circle in some funny way. And there are even points where C vanishes for every X. But you have to find which fixed point survives the finite rank corrections. Once you've done that, which is a non-trivial computation, you evaluate C at that specific fixed point. When I'm saying, so when I'm saying that C is positive or negative for X smaller than a half or X bigger than a half, what I mean is that for that one speci specific fixed point, which survives finite rank corrections. The bottom line is that X equals a half is atypical because the line is not deformed. Um, and you don't get symmetry breaking. But for all the other cases you do, and you don't need much to prove that. You only need to realize that you get a hyperbola. And this is very weird that there is a thermal moduli space of vacua. This thermal moduli space of vacua is of course lifted eventually by finite rank corrections. But the whole point is that the origin is not part of this moduli space. So regardless what the finite rank corrections are, you'll get one, fixed, you'll get one point on this, on this line. You might worry about the runaway uh, at finite rank, but we check that this doesn't happen. So you get one point on this hyperbola, which is the correct vacuum. In fact, soon I'll explain that the correct point is always the vertex. So it's the point where the hyperbola intersects one of the axes. And this has some funny consequences for the type of symmetry breaking that we've seen. Okay, so let me explain one more time the finite rank case, uh, the, the equal rank case. So one additional way to understand why C vanishes in that case is to go back to our formula for the thermal masses. You remember that I, I told you that on this slide, there is a hint that, finite, that equal rank is special. 
So the hint is this, this is the thermal mass. This actually vanishes in the large, large rank limit. It goes like one over M. By contrast, if you just think about one over N expansion, the thermal mass should be order one. So the equal run case is very atypical. It has a cancellation for the thermal mass at leading order. And that's the reason that we see this line not being deformed. For all the other cases, the, run, the, the, the mass squared comes out to be order one, and the straight line is deformed to a hyperbola. OK, so this is what's explained here. And here, what I explained on this slide is that the correct vacua that you find by doing the finite run corrections are the vertices of the hyperbola. Namely, one of the components of phi 1 squared, phi 2 squared is non-vanishing, and the other is vanishing. So let's summarize. If we start with this biconic, let me just summarize this whole thing. When you look at the biconical models, which have OM times ON minus M symmetry, for equal rank, there is no symmetry breaking. But for non-equal rank, the smaller group, the smaller one of the two, uh, spontaneously breaks. That's the rule. If M is not equal to OM minus M, you look for the smaller one, and that's the one that's broken uh, at finite temperature. At zero temperature, of course, you have a conformal filtering. It's gapless, and it has a unique vacuum. But at finite temperature, there are number Goldstone bosons. So the phase diagram is the following. We don't have to go beyond x equals a half, because uh, if uh, x and, and 1 minus x are the same. So for every point between x equals 0 and x equals a half, you have a coset, which is a sphere. And at x equals a half, there is a thermal gap. This phase diagram doesn't make a lot of sense if x is continuous. And indeed, if x is continuous, the thermal gap goes to 0, and you get a critical point. But at finite rank, x equals a half has a thermal gap, and this has a coset, so a number of Goldstone bosons. That's the answer. So we found a model which actually for all epsilon between 0 and 1 has symmetry breaking at finite rank. Why does this break down at epsilon equals 1? The reason that it breaks down at the epsilon equals 1 is uh, because of Coleman's theorem. This is continuous symmetry breaking. And if you're in 2 plus 1 dimensions, the sigma model, which has a target space, uh, which, whose target space is a sphere, develops a gap. An exponentially small gap, but a gap. So there is a gap. So this is true for every epsilon between 0 and 1 in this picture. Are there any questions? About uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the case of 2 plus 1 in a second. So in 2 plus 1 dimensions, everything I've said is true, except that the number of Goldstone bosons become gapped with an exponentially small mass. But everything else is true. There is an exactly marginal operator at large rank, and there is a modular space of vacuum, and you have a hyperbola, and so on. Zohar, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so there is something I'm not understanding. So all your analysis was based eventually on the computation of the Debye mass due to a one loop tadpole, if I'm not mistaken, right? No, no, so, it's not, just a second, a second. It's not a tadpole. The diagram is not a tadpole diagram. It's, a, it's phi zero, phi zero. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I call it a tadpole for a two-point function. And, and then, it's not uh, a cactus diagram. In yes, this. okay. Anyhow, from this one loop. So as far as I understand, if you are for parametrical small epsilon t equal to zero, this is fine. But now I'm, I'm, not, I'm mistaken by the following. So it seems to me that when, whenever you've got finite temperature, you can trust this small loop approximation only for temperatures which are less than one over epsilon. Otherwise, uh, higher loop correction will matter. So can you justify why your analysis based on this simple one loop is trustable? Right. So for conformal filters, any temperature is as good as any other. So if you can show that your conformal, if you have a conformal filtering, and if you can show that at some temperature it breaks the global symmetry, then it's true for any other symmetry, for any other temperature. I see, but from, the, from the beta, from the flow point of view, it looks like that t for t uh, when t is greater than one over epsilon, you go you, you your higher order correction do matter. No, but t is a dimensional parameter, and you have a fixed point, so it has no other scales. So how can you compare t and epsilon? Epsilon is just a, a dimensionless number. It is a dimensionful quantity, right? Well, your question has that you can worry about one of you can worry about higher order in epsilon corrections. So the of course the couplings receive some small corrections at epsilon squared, epsilon cubed, 
And, uh, but once you find that the thermal mass is negative for small enough epsilon, then the conclusion that there is symmetry breaking at any temperature is inescapable. Okay. okay. We're talking about the weakly coupled fixed point, right? So we take a weakly coupled fixed point. We cannot solve exactly for this fixed point, but we can solve in an expansion. So we find that to leading order in the expansion at finite temperature, it breaks the symmetry. So if you believe that these weakly coupled fixed points exist as true fixed points of the bootstrap, you know, true solutions of the bootstrap, then uh, the conclusion is inescapable. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so just to make a final comment. So in two plus one dimensions, strictly speaking, these quantum magnets or whatever, these fixed points uh, display the, ex the, the exact same thing properties that I said. They have a, at large rank an approximate, uh, exactly marginal operator, an approximate marginal operator. There is a modular space of aqua, it's deformed to a hyperbola. And there is a qualitative prediction you can make, with that, which is that the Goldstone bosons would pick up an exponentially small mass in n in two plus one dimensions due to Coleman's theorem. So it's, there is no symmetry breaking, strictly speaking, in two plus one, but uh, there is a sort of a qualitative fact, which, which is that the, the correlation length is much, much, much smaller than the thermal gap, than the thermal scale. So this is still a funny example in two plus one. It does not show symmetry breaking. I'm emphasizing it does not solve the problem in two plus one, but uh, it's still very funny that uh, the correlation length is much longer than the temperature scale. So, so huh? can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how do you know you don't have any epsilon expansion as you approach epsilon equals one? How do you know you don't have things which are non-perturbative in say e to the minus one over epsilon? Right, there could be, uh, so we've done two, there are two different analyses that you can do. One is small epsilon, very small epsilon. <clears throat> and that's just, that reduces to algebraic equations, which you can solve on the computer. And all these conclusions can be verified. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is large rank. And the large rank expansion can be set up in any number of dimensions. It amounts to solving some, to, it amounts to resumming some diagrams, which are called sausage diagrams. Mm -hmm. Or cacti diagrams, depending on what exactly you want to do. So it amounts to, resu to resumming uh, infinite class, uh, one, one class of pretty simple diagrams. You can do it in any number of dimensions and you find the exact same thing as in the epsilon expansion. So one reason that we're happy about the story is that the small epsilon expansion leads to the exact same results as the large n expansion. Both lead to this picture of hyperbolas at finite temperature, deformed moduli space, which then receives small corrections and so on and so forth. And the sine of C agrees. You can compute the sine of C which is the deformation parameter of this hyperbola, both in the epsilon expansion and in the large n expansion, and you find the exact same thing as okay. a function of the rank. So everything agrees, both in large n and small epsilon, and therefore it's also true in two plus one dimensions, except that in two plus one dimensions, there is an additional infrared non-perturbative effect, which lifts the Goldstone bosons. Thank you. So uh, I wonder, um, once you, uh, uh, discovered this kind of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in a uh, conformal field theory, uh, then uh, natural uh, would be to ask whether there is some kind of um, order parameter associated with this. Yeah, of course. Uh, this is the order parameter. Uh, o, uh, uh, o M. Let me just show where it was. This, this is the order parameter. That's what happens at finite temperature. Yeah. If you find a smaller group, in this example, I took M to be smaller than N over 2. This breaks to O minus M minus one. Uh, but but the other parameter, I mean, you can uh, you you could write it as in terms of fields or whatever. No, I understand right. that. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. It's the vector phi. It's this thing. It's the vector phi one. Uh huh. I see. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah, this this vector phi one. Yeah, yeah I understood. It's yeah. What forms in the fundamental representation? That's what breaks the symmetry. Mm -hmm. So there is, so this, door, the, the, this order parameter has a non-trivial expectation value at finite temperature. Okay, so this is basically the conclusion. So what do we learn from this? We learned that it seems possible that the critical point would be in a broken phase at finite temperature, a non-trivial interacting critical point. However, 
you can say that this is not the end of the story. Our example doesn't have a natural ADS dual. It doesn't make direct contact with the black hole no hair theorem. It's not an integer dimensions. So there is much more to understand. But the fact that these models exist even in the epsilon expansion uh, is very surprising, at least to me. Uh, so, of course, the next thing is to try to understand, try to construct real models in integer dimensions, which exhibit the same phenomenon. Another remark is that these models have a few relevant operators. In fact, our model has three relevant operators. Um, some of them you can see on this circle. So, if you look, sorry, I'll go back to the picture of the circle. When you take finite rank corrections into account, uh, then this circle, which we had here, uh, so one, of, so the, some, 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 some operators become uh, relevant when you take finite rank corrections. In particular, this guy. Uh, well, I, I won't have time to explain it, but there are three relevant operators at finite rank for this class of fixed points. So there are many directions in which this can be improved. Um, and we're now looking at gauge theories in three plus one dimensions. Zahar? Yes. Could you couple a Tadiasi model to an one model, just in the way you're describing? Perhaps it will, perhaps the Tadiasi model would then spontaneously break the true symmetry and would be okay at epsilon equal to one. Right. That would, that would, yeah, that, that, I'm thinking about such things now. So we have this example that does almost what you want. So maybe we can uh, use it in some way to trigger a Z2 symmetry breaking by coupling it to something. I'm thinking about coupling it to gauge fields now, coupling it to other phi to the four models. Indeed, the, the, if you want, we can talk about it over email. I'll be very happy. But that's exactly what I'm doing now. We're trying to use this to actually construct an example in two plus one. That's it. That, that's a related something. question. Yes. Um, so you, you, you could uh, imagine um, trying to disprove quasi long range order or show an example of in two plus one. What is that? Can you explain what is that? So if you have U1 symmetry breaking, uh, or, or not quite symmetry breaking, but you, you, you can't have symmetry breaking, but you can have quasi long range order, you can have a power law co correlation functions. Okay, yeah, that's a weaker, I see what you're saying. You're saying that uh, another thing you could try to prove, so the question that I posed was about symmetry breaking in non-unitary -unit local blah blah CFTs at finite temperature. You're saying that maybe we should look for gapless finite right. temperature phases, yeah? Right. yeah. Al algebraic, algebraic or algebraic uh, finite temperature phases. Right. Right, so these examples that we discuss here do not furnish what you said. They have uh, correlation functions which decay extremely slowly, exponentially in N, but nevertheless they decay exponentially. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an example of what you're saying in integer dimensions. In fractional dimensions, of course, these are good examples. Any other questions? Sorry, I had a slightly tangential question related to what you're saying earlier in the talk about intermediate um, order. If you put the CFT on a spatial manifold with some length scale, are there then examples of the intermediate temperature order? Do you know? No, when you have compact manifold, symmetries cannot break. Symmetry breaking is an artifact of the infinite volume limit. Well, yeah, I was thinking about a maybe non-compact manifold with some finite directions or something. I didn't think about it. But in compact space, of course, always all the one-point functions of all the order parameters vanish. Yeah. So symmetry breaking at finite temperature or zero temperature is an artifact of the infinite volume limit. Yeah. Maybe since you asked that, I'll say one word. You know, the quantum field theory books have a very beautiful description of symmetry breaking uh, as a consequence of the fact that in finite volume, you have two states, which are almost degenerate and split by a small exponential amount. And so there is this thing that's super selection sectors. But this kind of phenomenon, I don't exactly know how to describe it in terms of the spectrum of local operators of the underlying conformal field theory. It seems to require that instead of some degeneracy at low, for low-lying operators, you have some degeneracy for high dimension operators. So this whole phenomenon of the order, this order at low temperatures and order at high temperatures defeats the usual intuition about how Hilbert spaces look like at finite volume. So it would be interesting to recast this as a property of some bootstrap problem.
we have some comments about it in the upcoming paper, but uh, it's far from being exhaustive. Zahar, uh, question. So going back to your initial motivation for monography, so if a CFT that you heat up had some order, then you shouldn't expect such a CFT to have a weakly coupled holographic solutions. Is that correct? That's question one. And two, um, could you expect some quantum gravity that could be dual to such a thing, which you don't admit with the couple uh, limit, and what should be the property of those? Well, the no goal theorem was indeed proven for just Einstein gravity coupled to some scalars, right? And then it was extended in various ways for scalars with funny boundary. I mean, the no hair theorem. Yes. Proven for some black brains with some, uh, with some, with some matter fields. And you can imagine many loopholes in these uh, constructions. For instance, what about baryons? Yes. What about uh, uh, double trace deformations of various sorts? Uh, yeah, so there are many possible loopholes in those uh, no hair terms. Okay. I, I don't exactly know what will happen when one studies gauge theories in triple one dimensions. We've actually spent a huge amount of time on that. Uh, and we have something that is inconclusive. Okay, thank you. Zohar, um, when you take epsilon large, don't you have to worry about possible leading in one over n terms from the higher orders in the beta function? Right, so we did two things. One is to take small epsilon, where epsilon is the smallest parameter, even smaller than the inverse rank. <laughs> and the other thing that we did was to take finite epsilon and one over n expansion and do one over n expansion. These two methods have an overlapping regime where epsilon is very small and n is large and you can compare and they give the exact same answers in this overlapping regime. Is that, yeah, is that what you asked? I'm not sure that I answered the question. I, I, I was just wondering if, um, in the case where you keep epsilon large and look at one over n, if there are terms in the higher order, but because with your mass, you use this lambda equal lambda squared relation, right? With all the indices. Oh, the this one loop beta function. Right, this is, well, this is what you do. You solve this equation when you're at very, very small epsilon. Right, so if you consider, or you can, you know. Yeah, that's what we did. When control we did. of the one over n expansion, you may solve it another way too. Depends right, so we have, small parameter you choose. right. We have two expansions. One is small epsilon, and the other is large n, and they have a regime where they overlap, and in the overlap they agree. Right, but you also made a statement about taking epsilon large, less than one, but you know, order one uh, from below, and then using one over n. But you could worry that there are one over n terms in the say lambda cube terms that you didn't keep from the higher order beta function. No, but when I made this comment, when I made this comment, I did not use these equations. When I made the comment that you arrive, I made the comment that all this picture, you know, that there is a modular space of vacua and there's a circle of, uh, con of conformal filters. When I made this comment that this is true at finite epsilon, this was not through those equations. This was through a one over n expansion. But it's true at finite epsilon at large n, assuming there are no one over n corrections from the higher orders in the beta function. Is that no, not true? No. No, no, no. This is a true fact about the leading order in n of the uh, of the of this uh, biconical fixed points. Of course, when you take into account one over n corrections, this circle of fixed points is lifted. You have only uh, some finite, finitely many fixed points that remain, and of course, this moduli space is lifted. And so you get this you get this instead of this hyperbolas, you get just one point, which is the true so vacuum. Just, just to be clear, are you saying that this is an all orders result for the biconical fixed points at one over n, at leading order in one over n? All orders in epsilon, leading order in one over n, exactly. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I have I, a question. I have a question. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so uh, there are some situations in which the OM symmetry is broken. Do you know which operators gain VEVs at finite temperature that are charged under OM? What representations they are? I'm almost recognizing the voice. Who is that? Uh, I'm Luca. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. So what did you ask? I was concentrated yeah, on so, figuring out who you are. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I asked um, in the um, scenario where there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, yeah. which operators gain VEVs at finite temperature? Phi 1, the vector phi 1. But uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm asking more generally. I imagine an infinite number of charged operators gain oh, VEVs. I have no idea. Do all representations gain VEVs or only a certain subset? I have no idea. Okay. So, when, at the beginning, you presented this argument based on entropy. Yeah. We uh, suggested this doesn't happen. Uh, so, what's wrong with this argument? Or equivalently, can you pinpoint what it is in the structure of the Hilbert space that, that leads to this effect? The, of the zero temperature Hilbert space that leads to this effect. Yeah, I I think that the ordinary structure of the Hilbert space is that, uh, let's say for a symmetry breaking system, Hamiltonian in some compact large space, which breaks a symmetry at the infinite volume limit. I think that the Hilbert space has like two copies, right? And if you go to finite energy density states, then basically it, it, mesh, it uh, merges into one. So there are like two copies and then they merge into one. And that's why usually at high temperatures you go to a disordered phase. And here I think it's the opposite. Like uh, what our preliminary sh study shows is that there is one tower for low lying operators. And when you go to finite energy density, it splits into two. So what we did is to compute the density of states a la Cardi at high dimensions. And you get an additional enhancement by a factor of two that Cardi did not have, so to speak. So it's as if there are two copies of high dimension operators. That's all I know for the moment. And I do not know exactly how to pinpoint the mistake in the high school argument. I mean, that's what I, you know, I, I don't know where the mistake is in the usual argument. So it's not satisfactory, but that's what it is. Could it be that uh, your energy be, uh, becomes large in one of the epsilon or whatever. I mean, that, that this not, not entropy term becomes large. Right. I mean, this argument was always suspicious, right? I mean, yeah. when you go to very high temperatures, what do we say in school? In school, you say you go to high temperatures, so ST dominates. But of course, this is not true because there are states in the Hilbert space with arbitrarily large energy. Yeah. So it was never true, but it always gave the right answer. So we did actually an explicit computation of the free energy in this model. And we see that uh, there is a violation of the usual high temperature limit a la Cardi, which explains this phenomenon that we found. But I mean, strictly speaking, this argument was never really true. So. Any other questions or? Oh. Yeah, maybe if there aren't any other questions, we should uh, thank Zohar for the beautiful seminar. So. Okay, thank you guys for hosting me. Thank you. Thank you, Zohar. That was great.